Hello, and welcome to my channel. I am Damien Marie at Hope. In the simplest terms, I am an atheist humanist philosopher and prehistorical writer researcher at DamienMarieAtHope.com. I am specifically an axiological atheist. An axiological atheism can be thought to involve ethical and value theory reasoned and moral argument driven apathyism, agnosticism, atheism, anti-theism, anti-religionism, secularism, and humanism. Axiological atheists can be understood as a value theory or a value science atheist. As an axiological atheism's ethically reasoned and constructive pro-humanity. I am an axiological thinker, value theorist. The science of goodness, worthiness, usefulness, valuableness, virtue, reliableness, accuracy, validity, morality, integrity, beneficialness, etc., etc. We axiologists have a value consciousness. And in general, we see the architecture of humanistic humanitarianism value in people that we see as dignity beings. Places and things are not. Axiology is a value theory. In its broadest sense, it involves areas of philosophy that are deemed to encompass some evaluative or evaluation aspect. Therefore, it crosses almost all domains in some way or another. Now for a more detailed terms as to what I am. I am an axiological atheist, an anti-theist, an anti-religionist, secularist, humanist, rationalist, writer, artist, poet, philosopher, advocate, activist, with schooling in psychology, sociology, as well as I am an autodidact, self-taught in science, archaeology, anthropology, and philosophy. I promote science and am against pseudoscience, pseudo-history, pseudo-morality, things that are found in religion. Hi, this is Damien Marie Hope, and I am an axiological atheist which can simply be understood as a value theory or a value science atheist, or that I am an axiologist, which is a value theorist. And I'm also becoming from that the conclusion of atheism. But I don't talk about it a lot on my show or my, you know, podcast or my YouTube or whatever you want to call it. I don't talk a lot about is my gender. And um, I don't I don't talk about it because I see a lot of people talk about issues like this because that's um, makes them happy to feel empowered. Generally, when I talk about it, it just reminds me of my negative childhood and how even even to this day, I don't feel like there's a big movement to support people like me. Not that, you know, there's not movement supporting people or ones even that support people that are intersexed or people that are genderqueer. But that, it, in a sense, it's almost like it's an add-on. Not even saying that, that, that um, the regular society I'm talking about more than the LBGT individuals. The regular society, I feel, when they hear another thing, that's all they hear. <gasps> There's another one? Oh, now it's LBGTQI and then an A and then a where does it stop? It's, but instead of realizing that the problem to begin with was the false belief that there's only male and female. That was the false belief. So I don't think we're going to do all my stuff, sorry. <laughs> but anyways, I was wanted to say that we're, this, this show today, we're going to talk about stuff like this and an importance of inclusion and the importance of addressing things and why it is important to be taught and why we don't know, in a sense, miraculously, <laughs> that we do need to have help because often we can be blind to the experience of others. So on that positive note, <laughs> uh, I would like to introduce my wonderful guest. And could you tell us who you are and just a little bit about you? Hello, Damien. My name is Shannon Whittington. I am a gay female. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. 
I am also a clinical nurse educator and I consult with organizations around LGBT inclusion in the workplace, which is very important because nearly 50% of us hide in the workplace. I also train clinicians on how to care for transgender individuals after they have gender affirming surgeries. I'm an author and uh, this is my platform and it's going to be it until uh, I'm six feet under because it's so needed. I totally appreciate it. And I appreciate how you're always out there and you're always doing it in a really, you know, positive and open, friendly way. I know, especially, you know, I think that someone from a clinical, you know, thing could, could to some people, be uh, um, not a safe place in a sense. But I believe that you give off this era of, in a sense, being a safe person. And for someone who's coming from my uh, experience in childhood, a safe person, you know, is not a, a common thing. And so I think it's really great. And that's why I wanted to help, you know, do all I can for people to understand who you are and your value. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. It's, it's you know, there's a lot of places, spaces that aren't safe for us. Uh, we met on LinkedIn. Right. And I get quite a few DMs on my LinkedIn for people who are in this population. And I'll say, oh, well, let's, let's talk about this or that. And they'll be like, no, 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 no one at work knows I'm gay. Right. Oh, no one on the, I'm, I'm not out on the platform. Uh, I'm, I'm trans. Please don't tell anybody. Or I'll get a DM that says something like, I could tell you something about me that you probably wouldn't believe. And I kind of know where the conversation is going. So I always tell them, look, I don't out anyone on the platform. And I don't connect people on the platform unless they specifically say, do you another, know another trans person or right. bi or whatever. Because it's all about safety and confidentiality. You know, it's not our duty to out anyone. It can be very harmful in certain places. So I try to remain a safe space for this population. Yeah. And that, speaking of safe spaces, I want to address that a lot of people, um, being a, someone who's an atheist, also I'm uh, involved in debates and stuff like that and saying controversial things sometimes. And um, there's other people, Not I don't really have the, that same problem exactly, but there's other people that have a real problem with um, uh, the issue, especially one of the more conservative ones, because there's like, just like in every other culture, there's in a sense a left and a right, sort of. Not exactly, but I mean, sort of. And so most, uh, uh, I would say, are a good majority of uh, atheists pro or free thinkers or whatever, humanists, they support um, LBGTQ people, but there's some that don't. And they try to a lot of times talk about that safe space, which really, it really makes me angry. Uh, and, and it's also, like I said, you, you got to understand everything through the lens of my experience in my life of being really, in a sense, um, treated badly because of my gender issues and my um, um, being intersex. Even though I didn't totally wasn't informed exactly by my parents, I found out later the why they did mm -hmm. stuff. Not they, at the time. I just knew why am I being treated so unfairly? You figure out later, oh, well, that's why. I, to them, they were uber Christian and they believed in a sense they didn't have a firstborn because the firstborn male wasn't a male. So I'm a nothing, not a female, not a male, I'm a nothing or whatever. So, but anyways, so safe space, like I said, those students, people understand, even you or whatever, the people understand I have very, and I'm very, trying to be very calm about it, but I have a very, very strong feeling, especially about protecting people because of being so persecuted myself uh -huh. and so safe space a lot of times the conservative people will say oh well safe space is for people that are weak or whatever you know what people that have ptsd are not weak people that have been abused have been abused that's not weakness that's that's trauma and so to me and another thing that they'll like you'll say is well all you need to do is just like doing counseling where they exposure therapy where they make, well, actually I have a psychology degree. So I actually know that's a bunch of bull crap because you know, exposure therapy is only done with a safe person in a safe environment after a long time of safe conversation. And then it's brought in to their level of just at the level of safety. 
they want to feel. So this thought that somehow the whole population can go up to people and break their things and they think they're doing them a favor. They're making them strong. No, you're just another abuser. You're another perpetrator. And I don't want to do that. sad stories. You know, so I'm just saying, so when people say they need safe space, we need to make safe space. We need to have safe people. We need to have places. And so that's why I, I believe that it's important. I have this thing where I say home, open, honor, motivate, embrace. And everyone needs home. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. And I, I do. And, and I realize that, that because of, you know, like I always tell people, I realize the value of kindness because most of my life lacked it. But I realize it's so special that you guys, not you personally, but I'm saying like the world has forgot that it was special. It always was. In fact, I even show atheists my most powerful debate technique is undeserved kindness. Nothing is more powerful. When you deal with someone who is raging, and then you just go, you know what? I want to listen. You know what? I, let me understand. You know what? Maybe I didn't get it. It, it. When you do that, it breaks all of that. And it creates this realm for something positive to happen. And that's what I'm saying. I think it's so important for people like you to be out there. We need to have a voice because there's too many people that will kill someone for being gay or disown them or like I being intersex. And basically I never got treated. I'm telling you, even the front that like, the, like the, the head, the first son or the, the head of the family with the father, never the head of the family stayed open until my best friend came and lived with us and they let him stay there. And I told him, he even said to me, isn't this weird? And I said, you know, man, it was never mine. Far as, and I didn't at that time, I didn't even know why. I said, I don't even know why. And he goes, like, why do they treat you like you're almost not even here? And then they treated him, my friend, like he was the firstborn of the family. And he even lived there after I left. That's how weird it was. But I'm just saying, but it was like this unsaid thing. And then after I found out, I went and told my mom, hey, did you know this? Because the doctor laughed at me. That's another thing, too, about like I was saying about doctors. Not every doctor is safe. Like, so let me real quick have my, my, my thing with how I found out. I went there because I felt angry and stressed out and sexual. And so I thought maybe I had high testosterone. And I found out from the urologist, you have extremely low testosterone. Like lower than some women or most women at the, at the time. And he said, I would actually put you on testosterone therapy. And I was like, and that, that's when he started doing it. And then he told me, he said, you're intersex. You weren't told this. They knew this at birth. Yeah. And I go, they never told me anything. Yeah. So I'm going to ask my mom. She goes, yeah, we knew. We always knew. I'm like, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me when I liked, like, I wanted to wear makeup and I wanted to wear pink and I wanted to do stuff that was so in a sense, not my gender, why didn't you ever say, hey, well, maybe it's because you're intersex. Maybe it's because you're not. Because I, I felt like I didn't connect with men. I didn't connect with women. I didn't feel gay. I didn't know what the hell was going on. You know, I felt wrong. And I felt like I was alone and uh, with no one and no, you know, no safety, no nothing. No friends, no one that I could relate to, nobody I could point to and go, yeah, I feel like that. Nothing. It wasn't until I was in college for drug and alcohol therapy, not for me personally, I mean, to learn how to, to do it, that I started reading about gender stuff and learning more, you know, in college. And then I went and looked up the word gender queer because they wanted us to find about, you know, counseling different communities. When I read, read the word gender, the definition in Wikipedia, gender queer, I openly cried because it was the first time in my life. I read something that sounded like me. And I was like, whoa, I'm not alone. And then I also went and read the intersex thing and I found out that one in every thousand males is somewhat gender variant. And one in every 5,000 women. And the reason this possible for that 
difference is woman is almost the default. In other words, everyone's born with an X in a sense. Yeah. But it's the other stuff. And intersex can happen by X, Y, 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 X, zero, or, you know, whatever. Some other variance between. There's other ways it could happen, too, in, in, in the utero. Or there's other, but anyways, my point is that once I started realizing, oh, wait, I'm not that strange. Holy crap. One in every thousand men could be a little bit not a man. Why doesn't society start telling us the truth? That's births. That's not some, you know, agenda from anywhere, not from any side. That's just births. That's just the facts. And that, but, but it really started making me feel better. I don't know why, but I guess we all don't want to be alone. And even though we always talk about how unique we are and how unique we want to be, boy, when you're too unique, it doesn't feel real great. <laughs> and so it, it, having a voice, having someone out there that's championing and explaining, like you know, and like I said, especially the fact that you're in the medical field. When that doctor treated me like that and told me I was less than a woman, not really the greatest bedside manner, but especially when I was thinking I was just heterosexual man going in there because I'm a feral man and then go, oh, you're like a woman, dude. Wouldn't you know that? You know, and I, it, it, that really, so I'm saying about safe people. And, and I know that he probably didn't even think about it. You know what? Because he was never taught. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with trans issues, if you're not taught, or gay and lesbian issues, or being well being bisexual, if you're not taught, you know what? We're not born knowing. That's <laughs> so true. And I think it behooves us to learn. You know, I've been doing this work for five years, and even though I'm a part of the population, I knew very, I don't mean to say very little, almost nothing about trans, about intersex, about queer, about surgeries, about any of that. And, uh, but once I started in this space, I, I realized that I needed to educate myself. And I've been doing it ever since because there's a lot to learn and it's something that I want to change. You know, with intersex, the, the story that you just shared is very common. This is often hidden. Or a lot of times the genders decided at birth. And oh, it was. They they, yeah, they they did surgery on me that they lied about. Oh, there was a mistake. Uh, when they were doing your your circumcision, there was some problems. But, you know, and so they even, when I even said, why do I have, why is this different like this? And they're like, oh, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Nothing, nothing. Yeah, so you're right. But, yeah, they, they, I think that the least a child should know. I, I think their own body should not be a clue to them. You know, well, that, they shouldn't be, it should, their gender shouldn't be decide, decided by their parents no. or the doctor. And because once the child starts to get old, they're going to start to identify a certain way, and then they can make the decision if they want to have surgery or not. Some, totally some agree. Some intersex people don't want to have surgery. I wouldn't have totally done fine it. With it. I wouldn't have done nothing. I yeah, always tell people see, when they go, oh, do you feel like you're trans? You want to cut your genitals off? I go, my genitals already were cut. They're supposedly fixed. But I wouldn't have. It was just an opening at the bottom. Oh, well, if that's my body. It's my body. I wouldn't have felt bad. I really was really at mad. They were allowed to touch my body in that kind of a violating way. And then not even tell me my entire life. I, how is yeah. that legal? <laughs> no. Like, it's, it's like the whole family knows the secret except the person. Yeah, and that's not right, <laughs> like, you know. Something's wrong with this picture. Yeah. Like everyone knows except me, but it's about me. Yeah. And then I'm having these feelings. Like sometimes intersex people don't know they're intersex until they try to conceive or it starts to go through puberty. Yes. And then it's discovered and they're like, what? Yeah. So um, those are, you know, some things that really, really need to change. They really do. And I'm sorry that you had to through that it must have been very traumatic it was like i said and especially because i felt totally alone because you won't talk about it mm -hmm. i mean even and now if you hear lbgt but you don't really hear and hear people that talk about you know intersex and if i bring it up most people just get quiet that's it they don't say they don't say anything positive negative they just or actually let's take it back some people say negative but they generally go yeah yeah whatever we like you yeah whatever yeah yeah, yeah. you're 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 a person okay you're human i'm like no 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 you're i'm just told you who i am why would you sit there and then 
violate me by acting as if what I just said had zero value. It's because they're uncomfortable with the uh -huh. conversation, they're uncomfortable with the topic. You know, people will do anything to avoid those type of conversations that they have little knowledge of. You know, they'll avoid it at all costs. And then you'll get a blanket thing like, it doesn't matter to me, I just see you. Or, yeah, you exactly. Know, something like that. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, right. Because I feel like the exact opposite. Oh, then now I know you don't see me. How could you say you see me? I just told you who I am and you just denied it. Mm -hmm. But I, but that's why I really understand me personally how I can feel because I don't, on the outside, I don't look totally like I'm half female in a sense. But I, guess, but, if, but I would explain it that my body is like 90 to 80% male, a little bit of female stuff. And then I feel almost 60, 40 male, female. Almost mm -hmm. 50 50, really, but but a little more male, sort of. But like, but I, I think some of that is once again about safety. Because if you ever see me when I'm really safe and I'm really calm, I act way more feminine. Mm -hmm. And my whole mm -hmm. personality gets like more peaceful and loving and kind. But the more I'm like an aggressive attack, the more than I become like just, just the male. In fact, it almost feels like I get taller. My whole presence like enters me or something and people even get scared of me just even walking around when i feel like that because uh, i'm like and that's i feel like i just switched to total male weird but like i said it, it but it's still me and so it's it i i i don't i don't want to deny who i am that's like even my name i deliberately put the female name in my middle name i got my name changed because I said, I want people to know who I am. And I do not believe you truly know who I am. If you don't grasp, I'm not just man. If you don't That's get That's my the... middle name too. Oh yeah? <laughs> so I, I wanted, because I'm just not. And in fact, I've had uh, in the sense girlfriends that were too straight for me, you know, because mm -hmm. they felt that I was like dating a girl. They would say this, yeah, it's like dating a woman. And I go, well, I'm just being me. But anyway, so yeah, it, it's important. But, but that, that's what I was going to say. I really relate, and that's why I support trans issues a lot. I would support public anyways, just because I think it's ethical duty for us to support people, you know. But yeah. I'm saying, just so you know, and everybody, I'm just letting so you know that I also support it for a personal reason because I feel like of all the community, me and trans are the closest. Yes. In the sense. yes. I feel. Being gender queer, not not so much the intersex, but may, but the gender queer, feeling like I'm male and female, and I don't know how to explain it to you. It's like this, but it's polars with a bunch of things that kind of go in the middle. Or I don't know, but I, so I to totally grasp what it feels like to not be who you are presented or people believe you are or whatever. I don't know how to explain it, but yeah, I think trans and intersex are the least understood of all the letters. Yeah. Um, and you know, bi, they have a hard time too. Oh yeah. <laughs> my my, my wife is bi and she has a lot, a lot of hard time with, with people. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not outing her out with, um, accidentally. She already has been outed by me a long time ago. <laughs> no, she, she, she used to have a sticker on our car. I love my husband okay. and our girlfriend. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, so I, I agree by, by, but, but I think even lesbian. You know, but but I think like going back to the um, the trans though, real quick. A lot of people don't realize that like the pride movement started with trans people. They act like somehow they were allowed to be added. Like <laughs> you need to read some history. <laughs> yeah. Just like speaking of history, do you know that the oldest intersex figurine is twenty three or twenty two thousand years old? No. From Italy. Yep. From the Graviton culture. <laughs> yeah. I did and, not know that. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 do, I do archaeological stuff, so that's a big thing of mine getting it. Right, and, and that was just a, an offshoot thing that I found, not trying to look for it. And I was like, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> so that's all I was going to say, too. It's not a new thing. <laughs> Just yeah, like, I mean, people think that now all these people are just coming up, deciding that they're going to... That's what I'm saying. 
them. And, and it's like, no, I mean, people are starting to feel a little, a little bit more comfortable with coming out. So that's why we think there's more of us, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, we do find, what I do find is that um, kids are understanding what it is earlier. They're understanding you know, uh, non-conforming and non-binary and trans. Oh, yeah. We're much, much earlier. I just had um, one of the nurses yesterday tell me her daughter told her she was bi and she's 12. And I had another nurse tell me that her assigned female child at birth, four years old, identifies as male at four. And so she's trying to figure out, okay, what do I do to support my kid? And and right now, they feel like when it's summertime, they should only have on bottoms, swimming trunk bottoms, and should wear a tie and those kind of things. So, you know, people, kids as early as six years old have been, you know, reported to try and put off their penis because they felt like it shouldn't be there. So it's not like they're confused. Well, no, I, yeah, I, 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 I think personally that that, that gender dysmorphia thing needs to be either readdressed in a different way in the DSM or removed completely. Because yeah. I think that it can be absolutely a violation of, of human rights against uh, anyone, including children. Well, they're, they're trying to change the diagnosis of, because in the beginning when I was doing this, it was like for trans, if they wanted to have affirming surgeries, it was transsexualism. Right. And now it's gone to gender dysphoria, whereas that body part causes you great dysphoria. But they are trying to move toward gender incongruence. I think that sounds a little bit better. Right. And when we first started, we were, it was entitled gender reassignment surgery, sex reassignment surgery. And you know this language is linguistically fluid, right? It changes every three to five years. So now we're calling this gender affirming surgery. So we're affirming. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I yeah, like that. Should, should already have been there in the first place. See that? That's actually what I'm asking when I tell people when they ask like if they ask me what's my gender, I would say it's inter intersex gender queer male. That's my gender. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, and I don't care. How many intake forms have you seen where you could check all of that? <laughs> I bet not. Maybe. Facebook. <laughs> and that's what yeah, my Facebook profile says on Facebook. Something, well, I had to think, uh, I think I had to write it in. I don't know, but that 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 yeah, whole sure thing. Had to write it in. Yeah, that it whole thing. That's a whole thing is what it is. Not one of them. It's all that whole thing is my gender, because all that is why I, what I feel like. But you know, Damien, gender exists along a spectrum. I agree. Even within the heteronormative world. I agree. I, like, you know, I mean, even for me, like, I'm strictly gay, right? I'm in love with my wife. Right. We've been together for 21 years, but I'm more of a femme right. gay woman. Right. But there's some days that I want to put my combat boots on and, and my fatigues, and there's some days I want to wear red lipstick and high heels. Right. Yeah, That's the spectrum. Some days I right. feel more masculine and more feminine. Just like you said, we right. have masculine... Uh, you know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Right. Men have these hormones as well. So I agree. We're more alike than society wants us to realize. Well, that's true, and that reminds me of something medical I learned when I was in counseling. That at a certain age, women start getting a boost of, in a sense, testosterone, and, and men uh, lose it or something. I can't remember exactly what I think it was. The women, in a sense, get a little uh, uh, more. Uh, stronger or whatever, and then m men get like a little bit softer, or something like that. Like we actually, what it, what it was saying is, it's almost like it gets more neutral. Like we get older, and then it just kind of becomes this neutral gender almost. Like you know, well, testosterone drops in cis men like in their thirties right. on, on up, and what you'll start to see is like you know muscle degeneration, fatigue, you'll see them humped over, weight gain, not having as much drive and energy as they used to have, not being able to sleep as good. All of that are signs of lower testosterone. Now, if you tell a cis man, the average cis man, that they should, because I've done this before, and they're like, no, you know, oh, I don't need it. Um, hey, I think maybe your testosterone might be a little bit low. You're 45. Yeah. You don't have as much testosterone as you did when you were 20 something. And a lot of men don't want to accept that they need some supplementation. But as a woman, and we go through menopause, like, listen, I recognize when my estrogen right. testosterone is low. I'm like, 
I don't want to be depleted of that because it affects so many different things. Oh, yeah. No, I think health is important. And I, I agree with you. I, I, I wasn't saying, and like I said, when I went to the doctor and learned, I think I was 23 mm. when he said that I had the super low testosterone. I was 23, not, not just so. And imagine 23 <laughs> years old, a low testosterone when, when it should be at its most vibrant. Level. And, and I, I was horny as the day is long. And I told him, dude, I'm coming in here because I feel too horny. And he goes, you shouldn't have a sex drive. And I was like, you're kidding me. Then what do I do? And he goes, I guess you just try to think about other things, which actually I ended up doing. I have a really intelligent mind. I started getting more into being creative and doing stuff. And, you know, I, I, it was more like I had all this energy to, to do something and I wasn't doing anything. And so then it just my focus became, well, sex. Hey, it's great. Mm -hmm. Why not have tons of it? <laughs> yes. But, um, yeah. Anyway, that's why I just I wanted to clarify so people didn't think oh, that sure. just yeah. like at the time I wasn't overweight. I, I gained weight, nothing to do with that. I was muscular, mm -hmm. sort of. I mean, I weighed probably about 200 pounds. You no, know, I had a truck accident and I hurt my foot and then I had depression. And because of not being able to move and being stuck in a bed for a year, oh, you know, and, and, you know, having to be, be wiped or to go to the bathroom. I mean, it just, I felt demoralized and it just, Plus, I already had my childhood. It was really wonderful. So just it's just all this stuff and stress and I couldn't yeah. work and I felt worthless and just, you know, but you should I, write a book about this. Thing. Yeah, yeah you probably know. should. But but I, 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 I just realized for myself, even though in a wheelchair and everything, I said, you know what? I'm not going to stop. I'm not mm -hmm. going to stop people. Mm -hmm. If I can help some people, then I, my life is important for me. That I, I, I want to make a difference. I, 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 that's why I tell people that I'm an activist to me at the core. I want to change the world. Not happy with the one that was given to me. It's a piece of shit. It abused the crap out of me. And, and I told teachers at school I'm being abused. And they said, well, you can stay later. So you don't have to go home and just sit out in the backyard, you know, by yourself. So, I mean, you get locked out of the house. You know, so I it just treated like a dog. And so to me, the world knew. And so I realized, oh, that has to change. And the only way I can ensure it changes is I do something about it. I talk about it. I talk about it openly so that, that things could happen. And I try to connect with other people to talk about it because it can only happen by us helping each other. You know, it's it's to me, it's, that we rise by helping each other. That it it in that in all ways. That when we do that, when we work together. I mean, just think of the 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 stuff that that happens when we work together. Science, and and even like like the, the medicine, you know, coming out quick. Or people helping in, in you know hospitals to give the medicine. I mean, or to to help people that are sick. I mean, it, it has always been our best when we're helping, and it's That's always our shame when we don't. And and I and I, I was like, you know, whatever I have left, I, I'm gonna give it to humanity. I I, I told someone, I said, you know, I realized I want to be a friend to the world. That's what I want to be. I want to be a kindness aficionado, someone who truly grasps how to do that amazing thing. Just be a good human. You know? So important. You know, but it's a lot. You forgot, I feel. Oh, Just, yeah. Listen, I wrote a book called Kindergarten for Leaders, Nine Essential Tips for right. Grownups. And it's all about what we learned in kindergarten. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about life. it? Huh? Can you tell us a little more about it? Oh, sure. You know, it, it's, it's along the lines of what you're talking about. I was just like, where did kindness go? You know, I'm on the train in New York and someone sits on me. They don't say, excuse me, step on my feet. Don't say, excuse me. Don't hold the door. Don't say, thank you. I, I, I take lunch to one of my colleagues and never hear if it was horrible or not. And, and so I thought, you know, it just seems like we've forgotten what we've learned in kindergarten. <laughs> so I started asking a lot of people, what, do you, what are the rules that you remember from kindergarten? 
And, you know, um, I was telling my mom, I was like, mother, I'm writing this book. It's called Kindergarten for Leaders, uh, Nine Essential Tips for Grownups. And she says, uh, well, honey, you must remember that most people skipped kindergarten and went straight to first grade. <laughs> and I was like, that wasn't the answer I wanted. I wanted her to say, oh, that's a clever title, but she didn't. And I said, mom, let me explain to you what the book's about. And she said, I don't need you to explain to me nothing. I'm telling you, most people that uh, went to ki most people skipped kindergarten and went straight to first grade. So I'm walking my dog and I'm thinking, hmm, maybe she's, maybe she's right. So I start asking just random people, what do you remember from kindergarten? And do you know, Damien, over half of them said, oh, I didn't go to kindergarten. I went straight to first grade. Huh. That's funny. But those, and I said, okay, so have Do you know I did I did kindergarten twice? Did <laughs> you <laughs> kindergarten twice? Yeah, I was held back in kindergarten, believe it or not. They thought oh, they no. thought they thought I had oh. learning disabilities. It was just neglect. It was just oh, severe man. neglect. That's it. They thought I had some like mental problem or dyslexic. I'm none of that. Oh man. It's just abuse. That's but it, horrible. But anyways, right. so <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Don't, I don't have a nice story, so if I talk about my life, it's generally not like roses. More the roses is what I've done since then. Well, that's why <laughs> I really think you should write this down. This is too much to share on a, a podcast. I mean, it's great. Yeah. But if, like, you want to be kindness for the world, you want to be a friend for the world, you can be a friend for intersex people. And to tell them, like exactly what happened to you and you know we can talk about this offline but i really think that's something you might want to think about because this could help a lot of people it really could well i do have a video where i do talk and i cry in it yeah because it's it's that's why i try not to talk that much because i don't want to start crying and stuff that's why i said why some people bring up stuff a lot i don't bring it up all the time it's not like i'm scared to bring it out tell it to anybody it's mm. that it's I and generally I want to start crying because it's like not happy memories so of yeah. my life and stuff and it and, and feeling alone and all that you know and that but like I said the greatest thing is now man the, the fact yeah. that I went to college and found out different and the fact that I can know and tell people different and I have a lot of um, people you know that follow me because of my um, my rationalism and my atheism. Well, it's kind of like a light bulb goes off when you realize. This is what I am. You know, I'm intersex, oh, yes. gender, queer, identified male. Yes. Mostly. Yeah. I mean, then it's like, oh, so that's that's what it is. And then somehow you can move on with yes. your life. But whereas before it's like, what's wrong with me? Why are people treating me like this? Yes. I didn't do anything. I mean, what's you and you don't get it. I so and, I, and I thought I see guys right, and I would see like men do men things, and I'm like, I don't know, I'd rather go do plays and and do yeah. decorating and you know colors and paint and poetry, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. And they're like a football, like, football. <laughs> no, I hear ya. no, I hear ya. no, but no. I watched it one time. I was like, what's the point? Is yeah. just hitting each other. Yeah. They're like, no, you throw the ball. I'm like, and then you run <laughs> to hit each other, like. I tried out for wrestling. We just do the whole physical thing, you know. Why the running? <laughs> I just, I, it just that. I and I, I don't watch football. I never liked it. I'm not against people that like sports. I just don't like them. But yeah. there's probably plenty that don't like plays. So, hey, whatever. Everyone's got their thing. But I'm just saying. So yeah, it, 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 it is important. Uh, and like I said, but I also think, like I said, I do talk about. And I do talk about it openly. And like I said, my video I have where I talk a little more in depth about it. It's about 15, mm -hmm. 20 minutes where I cry just because I just wanted to tell people. Like, because I feel like sometimes it's so hard also online like, to get like, through what it feels like. When you hear me talk, cry, then you go, okay, I get it now. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can feel it more. You know, it's more uh -huh. genuine for you, the experience of wise. But I, I try. That's the best medium for you, you know? Yeah. Get your message out. Well, yeah, that's why I, I'm a talker. I'm a person that's good at <laughs> communicating. Like I said, the biggest thing, though, for me is that I just start with that I try to treat everyone with dignity. I see the whole world as dignity beings. Not that I'm denying any other attribute they have, but the first one for me is you're a dignity being full of worth. 
That's the first for me. No matter if I hate you, hate your belief, you do whatever, you're a dignity being. To me, you're someone who deserves respect. And I try to treat even people that call me names, I still try to. Because I know it's a dignity being calling me names. That hasn't changed. And I realize that it's some of that otherness that so I also am just another dignity being. I'm not special or unique in that sense. We're all equal. So all the other differences are like clothing or whatever, or your sexuality or your gender. To me, we're all this special thing that we're all this human. We're all this, this you know, intellect, this, this compassion, this humanity. And it's that that I respect in people. And it's that also I realize that we think, because we've been lied to by the bad people, that you can't make people change by being good. But if it was, why are they so scared of anything that's actually good? Why do they hate anything that's social justice? If it's so ineffective, why, why is it they have such an issue with it? They have the issue with it because it is so effective. Because humanity stirs our heart. As much as they try to stir the anger, I want to stir the humanity in people. I want us to understand that we matter, all of us. And I don't start with nationalism like America matters. When I think of dignity beings, that's just humanity in general, all of us. And I think that we all need to work together. You know, and, and, it, and there shouldn't be, you know, this, um, like it is now, where there's all this political... Nonsense. This is keeping us from the beauty of being together. And it, to me, it is so wild that all these people, they talk about like, like you know, as being uh, bigoted and sarcastic. Like, if you eat this, you're gay. If you get the shot, because I heard someone that was in Jerusalem or something talked about, some rabbi, I think, talked about um, that if you get the COVID shot, it might make you homosexual. You know, it, do they not realize that most homosexuals in the world had heterosexual parents? So if anyone's producing homosexuals, it's heterosexuals. And under their own <laughs> stupid logic. So we need to stop heterosexuals because they are producing gay people, you know. I mean <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but you're absolutely right. We are but, but, by heterosexuals a lot of times. <laughs> No, but but but, I, but I'm being I'm trying I'm trying being sarcastic I, I, in, a, in a joking way, funny, you know, trying to be. But so I'm I'm just making a comment that the logic is not good. Yeah. Because the, the truth is, they are your family. I was their family. You know, my 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 mom is dead now. You know, and she felt shame throughout her whole life. And about how she felt bad about how she treated me. You know, uh, and you and just didn't know what to do. You know? Yeah, but so I, I did. So I, I did feel like when she passed, I did feel you know better because we had worked that out. Oh, in a sense. I love to get that. Yeah. Because, well, because at first she was, she said to me when I changed my name, she said, "How are they going to know you're a man?" Yeah. And I said, "It's my middle name." First off, I mean, what a question for my mom. I said, "Hey, if I changed name, I made my name to Marie," and then she says, "How are you going to know you're a man?" And then I said to her. What does it matter if they don't understand? Mm -hmm. She says, well, what if they think you're gay? I said, what if they do? Mm -hmm. She says, you're not gay. I said, I don't care. I have no problem with someone thinking I'm gay. You know why? Because yeah. gay people are fine, just like straight people or bi people or pansexual people or asexual people. But guess what? I'm cool with people that don't want to have any sex at all because yeah. it doesn't matter. I support humanity. What I don't support is this bigotry against people for being themselves. And I, I was born, I shouldn't have been shamed or hurt ever for just being born. The fact that I was born a little different is not even that different. <laughs> you know, and the fact that the same thing with someone trans, someone is born and, and it, they do not, just like me in a sense, the mind is a little different than what's going on. For me, I grasp that. And I, I think that people really need to have compassion. That, you know, yeah. because I think that they're seeing through their own eyes. They're like, well, I'm fine. Well, I could say I'm fine. I could never tell anyone I'm genderqueer. They probably would notice I don't follow gender rules. But if I didn't tell them, they would think, well, he's probably still male, just a little weird. But 
I do tell because I don't want to just use privilege to hide behind that I could yeah. just act or try to act normal, which I have done in my life, you know, but I don't, um, I don't think that, that people are grasping always, you know, the value of the stuff that, you know, you're doing because it's not just like me, like you said, it would be more impactful on your level. See, I, like you said, I give an experience and I'm, I'm getting to a few personal people, but you're going to get to the people that is going to affect or support all those other people. To me, the, 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 the need to teach other people who are not is greater even than teaching the people themselves because the people themselves can learn from those other people. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, I would have loved to have been someone who would sit me down and go, look, this is how it is. This is what yes. it is. I well, see you're, awesome. I see you're kind of feeling this way. And you're saying to me that you feel this way. You don't connect to men. You don't connect to women. You how you don't want to. You, I, I was because they, they in fact, they called my school instead of playing with myself. My dad thought, of course, the worst that it was something sexual. It wasn't. I was just off by myself doing my own thing because I didn't really connect to you know because i i didn't feel like sports i didn't i didn't know what you know so i just went by myself but so you know if somebody that's why i was i wanted to get to the point because you said the point and i do agree my experience would absolutely help people that are intersex or people that are gender queer or maybe people that are trans or whatever that understand the similar things but you are going to go and talk to the people who could have an impact on on the trans and the intersex person's life in a way yeah. that, you know, could be, because, I mean, people don't realize, like, if you ask people, what are you, they'll generally tell you their job. So if you go and you help people at jobs be better people, and that's how humans identify themselves generally is their job, you, you can see where I think that's a great value that people aren't grasping how important it is. Because you're it's very important because people want to be the best expression of themselves and they don't want to have to hide who they are when they're at work. It's yes. very hard to do that. I've, I've done that before. I was miserable. I left that hospital. You know, I fell in love with my coworker and we had to have, you know, different entrances and different exits and we couldn't meet together and, and didn't want anyone to know because there weren't really gay people back then or everyone was hiding. And it was just emotional mental turmoil for me and I've also worked at organizations where I'm totally out and it's totally fine uh, like now and uh, it's it's great it's much better but sometimes I think a lot of organizations don't realize what they don't know and they haven't addressed these issues and sometimes I'll get a call when they've done something or said something they shouldn't have said or they should have done something or said something they didn't do anything and that's when my phone will ring and say hey they've got a pain point we need you to come in and train us on being you know culturally sensitive to this population and I always tell them it's not a heavy lift you just have to be willing and open to understanding that there's more beyond heteronormalcy oh, there's yeah. more beyond the binary Oh, yeah. Um, just, you know, you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to embrace it, but just know that this exists and that these people are entitled to, this, entitled to the same opportunities that you have. That's all. We're not asking for any special treatment. Just the same, you know? But like I said, so that's why I told you at the beginning, I feel like that what you're doing is helping to create safe spaces for LBGT people. Because when you address the job, you address someone's life to me. Yeah, I mean, because we all want to work. Do you know how many trans people can't get work? Yeah. How many queer people, non-binary people can't get work because of how they look or maybe their expression doesn't match how they sound? I mean, that's ridiculous. Who cares? You know, organizations who are more diverse make better decisions 87% of the time. This is according to Forbes, okay? Better decisions, what is that? Better outcomes. Everyone wants that. So we just have to realize that, um, hey, we aren't going anywhere. There's nearly 10 million of us here in the U.S. alone. I think there's more, actually, but because we are hidden. Um, and so it means we're in your organization. It means we're sitting next to you. We're on the plane. We're your dentist. We're your 
primary care provider. We are your server, you know. Uh, we are everywhere. And it's very hard to find a person, a straight cis person, who has not had at least one encounter with someone of this population, either their cousin's gay, their daughter is transitioning, their in-law of the so-and-so, so-and-so just found out they're having twins and it's two guys or whatever it is. Um, almost everyone is affected by oh, this, yeah. so we, we can't keep pushing this under the rug. So I'm really glad that you gave me the opportunity to speak about this today, Damien. I appreciate the uh, invite to your show today. Thank uh, you so much. Well, definitely. And then I'm really honored to have you. Like I said, I really feel that you're creating safe space and you're a safe person. How much cooler can that be? <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Thank you so much for having me today. And let's right, definitely stay in touch, okay? Definitely. And could you tell um, people real quick, um, anything particular that you want um, to let them know about you or that they can go or get or go ahead and oh sure uh, well my primary platform is linkedin and that's shannon whittington uh, you'll see all the flags and stuff under my profile so you'll see that that's me and my website is whittingtonconsulting.com and if you go on there and plug in your email i'll give you a free chapter of that first book kindergarten for leaders but I, what i'm really excited about is that I'm releasing the book LGBTQ plus ABCs for grownups, and it explains flags. Like I see all these flags behind me, what the colors mean, right. what the letters mean, what the symbols mean, pronouns, terminology, what is trans, what's all these. You know, it's just very basic 101 for basically straight people who want to be allies or don't really know how to ask certain questions, but don't want to offend. Or people in this population feel like they have to explain everything. They can just hand them the book. So I'm happy about that. Yeah, that's great. Have you ever, I read the book called My Gender Workbook. That's a book that I read that I was like, whoa, this is cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't read that one, but. Yeah. yeah, it's, it talks about like binary and just stuff, but it, but it doesn't, it, it, it's almost like it assumes that you don't know when you're reading. It's kind of a weird, cool oh. book. That's kind of what I do in my book, assume you don't know, because there's so many yeah. who don't. But it's not as an insult, but just very, very basic. Right on. Beautiful. And I um, appreciate your time. And uh, everybody, have a great day. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. I'm going to um, stop the recording. Hold on. <laughs>
I am an axiological atheist, an anti-theist, an anti-religionist, secularist, humanist, rationalist, writer, artist, poet, philosopher, advocate, activist, with schooling in psychology, sociology, as well as I am an autodidact, self-taught in science, archaeology, anthropology, and philosophy. I promote science. And I'm against pseudoscience, pseudo history, pseudo morality, things that are found in religion.